Hello and welcome back. Today I'm going to share with you a really cool paper that has uncovered some new findings on amino acids and coral health. Hello, welcome back everyone to Amra Azul TV. Uh, this is going to be the fourth episode of my Reef Science playlist. So if you haven't already checked out uh, the first three episodes, including the controversial one on nutrients and the equally controversial one on uh, coral feeding, please uh, do check them out. I have uh, the links right here. All right, so uh, we all know that some corals are uh, are pretty... Uh, robust and and do well in virtually like all water parameters while others are super sensitive so uh, the footage that you're seeing here is from a recent vi uh, diving trip and essentially you're looking at a graveyard of Elkhorn corals uh, this is an Acropora coral and uh, you see that you know essentially lots and lots of uh, dead Acropora skeletons uh, on, on the bottom here and, and but lots of other corals nearby that are essentially doing well and, and still thriving and we've known that uh, when uh, when climate uh, when coral bleaching happens often it's essentially a problem with Acropora what we see in nature is kind of echoed in our tank so Acropora really difficult to keep they suffer from lots of problems like SDN and RTN and, and lots of reef keepers have essentially pulled their hair trying to uh, keep Keep them happy. Uh, well, on the other hand, things like mushrooms and anthids and bird's nest corals uh, tend to do really well. So, uh, what I'm going to share with you is a really cool paper that was uh, published last year that uh, perhaps helps us kind of understand why some corals are way more sensitive than others, and maybe it offers uh, a possibility of an intervention. Uh, that could help us uh, maybe rescue some of the sensitive corals. All right, so let's get started. Be before uh, before I actually show you the paper, I want to take you through uh, uh, what is currently known about coral taxonomy. So we hobbyists call things as softies, LPS, and SPS, and there isn't really like a strong... Uh, scientific support uh, well actually there's no scientific support for these terminologies so what what i'm going to show you here is uh, what is kind of known about coral taxonomy so this is uh, a phylogenetic map an evolutionary map uh, uh, from uh, 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 oh man i can't pronounce this last name kitara kitara i think kitara et al uh, published in plus one in uh, uh, in 2014 and so the idea here is we have uh, yeah the basal uh Basal corals are essentially are things like mushrooms and zoanthids. Uh, then instead of SPS and LPS, uh, coral taxonomists kind of uh, specify, uh, like essentially agree to uh, split stony corals into two group. Uh, one is called robust and one is called complex. I, I, I always think that robust is kind of simple, but because <laughs> simple versus complex, uh, robust is not the opposite of complex, uh, but they, they call it robust and complex. Sometimes uh, in my presentation, I'll, I'll substitute robust for simple, but just know that the scientists call it robust. And, you know, what are these things look like? Where well, I'm going to show you the tree. Uh, this is really busy, so I'm going to first break up the this basal part here. Uh, and you see that you know the basal uh, group to the stony corals are things like the recordia mushrooms, the discoma mushrooms. So you know the softies, essentially what we call as softies. And then the stony corals uh, are not clearly cut as we think of them as as LPS and SPS. As a matter of fact, a lot of the complex corals include things that we consider SPS like Acropora and Montipora and, Ac and Acropora but they also include the Euphelia like your Torches, uh, uh, your Parietes, uh, your Ganipora so it's it's we don't see this LPS versus SPS distinction uh, but just to kind of keep in perspective so the complex corals here are like things that are the Acropora, Montipora but also some of the things that uh, are, are not like sticks, but they still build like a stony base like the Euphelia. Uh, the simple or robust Acropora include things like the Ceratopora and the Postulopora. So these are the cauliflower corals, uh, uh, Stylophora, uh, and your kind of bird's nest type corals. And, you know, 
from my experience, obviously things like Bird's Nest and uh, Pasolopora are essentially indestructible uh, relative to uh, uh, an Acro uh, Acropora, which are uh, way more sensitive. All right, so that's kind of the background to coral taxonomy. The take home message here is that uh, there is robust corals uh, that are kind of more simple, more robust. Uh, they're, they're less likely to be affected by change. And then there's the complex corals, which are a little bit more sensitive. So the paper that I'm going to discuss today is this fun little paper. Uh, it's called Comparative Genomics Reveals the Distinct Evolutionary Traje Trajectories of the Robust and Complex Coral Lineages. Oh, yay. Uh, <laughs> only I get excited by these kinds of titles. It was published in Genome Biology by Yang et al. And essentially what this paper did is they sequenced the genomes of several corals and they essentially compared a few representatives of the robust uh, slash simple corals, stony corals, with the complex slash sensitive uh, complex corals. And so uh, just to kind of give you an example of the genomes that are compared, so uh, the robust corals in this analysis were uh, uh, represented by, by a gonist, uh, gonistria and a fungi, uh, the fung uh, fungi, fungi plates. The complex corals were represented here by a galaxia, two Acropora and Acropora uh, melipora, and, and Acropora digitifera, as well as the Porites coral. And then the outgroup for this comparison, it's uh, when, whenever you do these kinds of evolutionary analysis, you want to have a an, an distant relative, and a distant relative in this comparison was the anemones. Okay, so I'm going to, th there's a lot of science presented in this paper. Uh, but I'm going to show you the one finding that I thought was really, really amazing. Uh, and uh, a background to this is that uh, we're going to, the story is about histidine. And histidine is an essential amino acid. Uh, you need histidine to essentially make, uh, 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 it's an amino acid used for uh, synthet synthesizing protein. So it's, it's a very important uh, uh, molecule. Uh, many animals and plants, uh, actually many plants, uh, are able to make uh, histidine and plants make histidine by essentially taking some simple molecules and transforming them into this uh, uh, histidine molecule and and essentially there's about uh, nine or ten about ten enzymes uh, that are needed to take the precursor molecules and synthesize uh, histidine all right so uh, histidine is important some organisms are able to synthesize histidines all right and the main point that like the the million dollar slide from this study is this. So it turns out when the authors of this paper, Ying et al, looked at the genomes of the complex uh, uh, stony corals and compared them to the robust stony corals, they found that the complex stony corals lack some of the enzymes uh, and genes that are needed to make histidine. So uh, the fungi here and the Ganeastera have all of the genes intact to be able to, to take precursor molecules and synthesize histidines. Uh, the Acropora uh, and the Porites and, and the other, compl uh, the other complex, uh, I want to call them SPS, but I, I'm going to avoid that. But the, the complex stony corals lack this gene, HIS2, that is really important to biosynthesize histidine. So... The, that's that's it that's that's kind of the mayor i mean they found many many other really cool things but to me this stood out as a, a really big difference the idea that uh, acropora are not able to make as an essential amino acid versus other basal uh, basal and and simple uh, uh, more simple uh, corals are able to synthesize by uh, his histidine so uh, what this means is that the complex stony corals essentially are dependent, are entirely dependent on their zooxanthellae, their symbiotic uh, uh, algae, to make histidine for them. So uh, versus the uh, the uh, the softies and 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 uh, uh, robust or, or simple uh, uh, stony corals, 
uh, they're able to synthesize biohistidine uh, on their own. So uh, to me, th this is really like eye-opening. Essentially, it, it suggests that uh, you know when when things are good, uh, the the zonthexelli are providing all of the uh, histidine that the acropora needs. Uh, but if there is any problem that essentially either upsets uh, histidine production by the symbionts, then essentially the acropora and the, and the more complex stony cor corals are going to suffer. They're going to essentially lack this amino acid, essential amino acid, versus uh, the the robust corals and the softies. They they're they're not depend they're not as dependent on their uh, zooxanthellae to make this. Uh, uh, a macromolecule uh, to sorry to make this um, uh, essential amino acids because they're able to synthesize the amino acid themselves. So that's 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 it. I, I mean, it, it's really early days in this, but I, I think this has like a lot of uh, uh, immense importance in terms of understanding why acropora are uh, tend to be sensitive and and other uh, and other uh, stony corals, uh, ro complex stony corals, tend to be pretty sensitive. Uh, and then I wondered whether, uh, I know a lot of people uh, do amino acid uh, supplementation to their, uh, uh, to their SPS to, for Acropora specifically. And I, I think this paper suggests that it, it, might, not, it might not be useful uh, to do full amino acid supplementation uh, because the Acropora can synthesize a lot of the amino acids. But I think in the case of histidine, I, I really wonder whether maybe targeted uh, supplementation of histidine, just just the amino acid histidine, uh, especially in cases where where the corals are experiencing some stress, wh whether that might actually be helpful. So uh, yeah, but what, I guess what I'm trying to say is that uh, maybe it's not super helpful to just dose amino acids all the time, but after reading this paper, I'm thinking that maybe maybe there is a place for uh, supplementation of some amino acids, specifically histidine, uh, during critical times, uh, maybe when frags are transplanted or, or whenever there's big changes that would uh, essentially upset the, uh, the population of the symbionts uh, that are providing histidine to Acropora and other uh, complex corals. So thanks so much, guys. I uh, hope you enjoyed this video. I've, I've been having a lot of fun uh, uh, reading up on uh, uh, research and biology of corals and I'm, I'm glad that I'm uh, able to share some of this knowledge with you. So thanks so much for watching and see you next time.